What impact does the 19th century free market economist Frederick Bastiat have on libertarians today? Join Richard Ebeling and me in this week's Libertarian Angle as we examine that question. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation. This is this week's Libertarian Angle, the show, as you all know, that brings you the principled and compromising case for the libertarian philosophy. I'm joined by my co-host, the principled and compromising libertarian, Richard Evelyn, professor of economics at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again. Excellent. And good to see you. Yeah, and thanks for tuning in. If you're new to FFF, come and visit us at FFF.org. Subscribe, of course, to this YouTube channel. You get notices of our Libertarian Angle and other online events we have. We uh, have an FFF Daily, which is free. Uh, we have strived for 20 years to make that the best Libertarian commentary page on the Internet. we got a monthly journal called Future of Freedom. Uh, we have online conferences and seminars and things like that. So, Richard, you know, we've discussed other giants in the libertarian movement and, uh, historically, as well as people living today. Uh, I'm not sure we've ever covered Bastiat. Maybe we have, but I thought, you know, Frederick Bastiat is such a critically important figure in libertarianism, and he has so many important lessons to impart to us, even though he wrote in the 1800s. That I thought, you know, why don't we devote a segment to Frederick Bastiat, especially for people who are not familiar with him, but even people who are, which of course means most libertarians. Uh, it's always good to get a refresher uh, presentation on, on some of these gigantic figures like Ludwig von Mises or Friedrich Hayek, who we've covered extensively, and, as well as Frederick Bastiat. Uh, when I first discovered the libertarian philosophy in the late 1970s, among the first people I discovered was, was Frederick Bastiat. And I remember just poring over his books. I, I think there's four of them, uh, including his little booklet called The Law. And they just had such a profound impact on me in terms of just understanding basic principles and fallacies that, that are promoted even to this day, economic fallacies. And the way he could write it was always so clear and so succinct. And the way he would reduce things down to a very simple level, a complex economic phenomenon were just, it was incredible to me. And then his, his use of ridicule and sarcasm was just fantastic. I, I, one of the essays, my favorite essays is his essay on the, uh, the candles, the candle makers petition where he has a, the candlestick makers in, in, uh, France petitioning the King to, uh, to have protectionist measures against the unfair competition of the sun. And it was just this great expositioning in favor of free trade and against protectionism. But he, he put it in terms of, of the sun, that the sun, you know, it, it, it's over there competing without any cost. It's just this natural light. And so he said, let's, let's, Let's board up all the windows in, in uh, France to protect the candlestick makers. I mean, this is an important industry, making candles. And it's not fair that the candlestick makers have to compete against the unfair competition of the sun. So with a law requiring everybody to board up their windows, this would produce jobs for the, for the candle industry and, and protect all the people involved in that industry. And it was just really an indictment of the all the protectionist measures that were being adopted in France at the time. Well, of course, the principles apply even today. And so uh, the guy always served as a great inspiration for me, and uh, I studied his books extensively. Uh, they, they were not perfect from a libertarian standpoint. And, of course, this was a time when the labor theory of value was still prominent, and Bossiat was talking about the labor theory of value. But overall, this guy was phenomenal, and it was such a tragedy because he ends up dying at a very young age. I think he was like only 49 or so. He, he got tuberculosis, and I think he moved to Italy. You can correct me. You, you always, you're always good on the biographical uh, data, but I think he moved to Italy where he died, and I think he was buried in Italy uh, at, a, at a very young age. 
So with that, why don't I turn it over to you and get your perspective on this this real libertarian hero, Frederick Bastiat. Well, let me start off, in fact, giving a brief bio about him for viewers and listeners who may know little or nothing about him. He was born in 1801, and he died at a relatively early age. He died in 1850 from tuberculosis, as you pointed out. His parents died when he was relatively young, and he went to uh, a rural part of France near uh, Bayonne, uh, and lived on his uncle's farm and sort of grew up expecting his uncle expecting him to be a farmer. Uh, he eventually inherited the place when his uncle passed away. But he had the, more of an interest in ideas. And at a relatively early age, he discovered the free trade literature of what we call the Manchester School, the British Manchester School, the literature of the British free trade movement. Uh, that eventually brought about the demise of the mercantilist and protectionist legislation in Britain. He, in fact, started corresponding uh, with uh, the leaders of the British free trade movement, uh, John Bright, uh, particularly Richard Cobden. They become became strong, uh, if you will, uh, pen, not just pen pals, but pen friends. Uh, but uh, what really honed his understanding of this literature, Jacob, was that uh, he had a neighbor who was a socialist. And uh, by this time, Bastiat had absorbed all of the free trade and uh, the classical liberal literature of that time, particularly the French writers uh, like uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste or the physiocrats. Uh, and I remember in the 19th century, when you have a neighbor, let's say 10 miles away, you're not going to see him every day because how do you get around? You walk, you ride a horse, you're in a wagon being pulled by a horse. So what they started to, to do was they started corresponding with each other, uh, making their respective cases and rebuttals on their arguments for uh, free trade and liberty versus socialism. Uh, and it was writing these letters, uh, as the biographers suggest, that Bastiat slowly but surely was honing his, his literary skills, uh, conciseness, clarity, uh, sarcasm, uh, without ever being rude because this was a friend neighbor, and he's trying to reason with him. And in fact, finally, as the story about him goes, he persuaded his neighbor to give up his socialist ideas. He was so successful. Um, he, he wanted to devote himself um, to these ideas such that he went to Paris and he began a free trade uh, tabloid or magazine called, in French, Free Trade, uh, obviously inspired by the free traders in Britain. Um, but he, it didn't last more than a year because he just couldn't get enough subscribers for it. Uh, he was elected to the French Parliament, and uh, he was in the French Parliament when he came down with tuberculosis and had to step down, and as you were saying, moved to uh, Italy. Uh, his doctors prescribed a, a drier, warmer climate, and he passed away in Rome in 1850, as you were saying. Um, he was, he was. Well, he could not gain the support and the and, and the and the uh, policy influence that the British free traders has. He was recognized and respected so much so that in a part of the France where he had grown up and lived, uh, in one of the towns there was a statue to him, uh, a a a, uh, a bust. Uh, uh, but that 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 statue and bust no longer exist, Jacob. The reason being, it was torn down during the Second World War and was melted down to make bullets for the German army. Uh, so there are sketches or, or sort of like little sketch portraits of this statue base and then the, the bust of him at the top of it, but it no longer exists. Uh, one of the tragedies um, is, is that he, while he's been respected in America and the United States by conservatives, classical liberals, libertarians, uh, basically in France, He's had no such recognition. Uh, I remember that uh, back when I was the president of the Foundation for Economic Education, this would have been around maybe 2004 or 2005, uh, a French uh, economist came over for one of the fee seminars. He had never heard of Frédéric Bastiat before. Oh, wow. And of course, Fee was publishing, you know, these editions of Bastiat's translated essays, Economic Sophisms, Essays in Political Economy, his one full book, uh, Economic Harmonies, which came out just before he passed away. 
Uh, and and this, this, this French fellow said, why should I read it in English, right? I can read it in the original French, right? So he goes back to France. He related this to me later. And he's, he's scouring through the libraries. He's looking in bookstores. No Bastia in any place. He finally found in some through an interlibrary loan one one copy of his his oeuvre, his collected works, in an obscure library somewhere in rural France. So that's how he read it. Okay. Now I understand now Bastiat's works are, are available in French again; they've been reprinted. But but for the longest time, uh, you know, the, the, the phrase is "You're never a prophet in your own land." Uh, that really applied to him. Now, uh, more particularly, if I can sort of elaborate or compliment your emphasis on the ideas, uh, his wit and sarcasm was brilliant, like in the candlestick maker's petition. But he has another one, which you'll recall, is that there's two towns that tr that have potentials to trade with each other, but there's a mountain in between. And it's very costly for them to traverse around the mountain to reach each other's markets. So a tunnel is built through the mountain which of course radically lowers the cost of transportation and makes the goods much more uh, price uh, available for the respective citizens of the two towns. And so what do the two towns do in his story? They put up tolls at the respective ends of the, of the tunnel. So before it can get there at these much lower transportation costs, it gets taxed to push up the price again. <laughs> and you know, just to protect the existing respective, uh, quote, municipal producers from the foreign competition of a township just on the other side of the mountain. Uh, he, uh, he could be biting in, in his sarcasm, in his ridicule of the irrational logic. But one thing that stands out about him when you read his essays, he is never disrespectful or rude to the, to the proponent of that wrong-headed idea. He always assumes that the other fellow is well-intentioned, has, has a desire to improve the conditions of his fellow man, but has merely misunderstood the logic of how markets and prices and competition work. And therefore his, his sarcasm is, and, and, and humor is merely to sort of make the fellow joke into realizing his own errors. Uh, and, and that makes his, his, his essays enduring in a personal sense. But I, I would also um, mention that one of his most famous essay, well, he has two famous essays. Let me mention them. Uh, first of all, there's The Law. Again, a, a piece that he wrote, it's a monograph that he wrote uh, shortly before he passed away. It's considered his classic. And it is a, a, an explanation and a defense and an argument for the idea of individual rights based upon the natural law of each person having a right to his own life and liberty and honestly acquired property. Uh, and he makes, he says that men may come together, in the, in the sense he's copying the English philosopher John Locke, men may come together for mutual protection and form a government, but the government clearly can have no powers and, and just, justice in their actions other than what an individual could do for himself. I have a right of self-defense, but I certainly don't have a right to initiate force and take those interesting books that are on the shelves behind Jacob Hornberger's uh, desk there. Uh, I could ask to borrow it, I could offer to buy one of his books, but it would be unjust for me to use force or threaten it to get any of the books off the shelves there behind you that, that you might have. Uh, well, any such aggression would be viewed as certainly immoral and the law is supposed to treat as illegal based upon that ethic. Uh, but governments, sometimes have, in fact, perversely and pervasively have come to uh, pursue what Bastet called legalized plunder. That is rather than negatively protecting our respective rights and uh, leaving us to live our lives as we peacefully and honestly choose to, following our own course and in voluntary association and collaboration and association with others, both inside and outside the marketplace, uh, governments now use its legalized authority of the threat and the use of force to transfer the property of some to others through regulation, through redistribution, uh, through government planning, and that therefore the law is perverted, as he expressed it, and made to be an agent of theft rather than a protector against the theft by any of the respective citizenry. This is a profound argument, the way he logically develops and elaborates this in an extremely 
a straightforward, clear, and commonsensical way. The other essay that have, his has become a classic is called What is Seen and What is Not Seen. And his famous uh, way of explaining this is that uh, so, 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 some, some young rascal uh, picks up a brick and throws the brick through the window of a, of a local baker. And of course, the baker comes out and is shaking his fist at the street urchin as he runs away. And people on the street come to get, oh, yes, yes, they, 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 youth today, they don't respect property. But then Vasya says, yeah, at some point, someone starts to wax philosophic. Yes, it's a great tragedy for the baker. His window has been broken. But think of it. It's going to create business for the glazer because the baker will have to hire him to replace the window pane. So what is the misfortune of the baker is the good business and, and opportunity for the glazer. But besides, the glazer will have to hire an assistant because if it's a big piece of glass that place, he can't lift it and put it into the, the window frame himself. He's, he's going to give work to another person. And of course, on and on and on. And Bastiat says, well, that is what is seen and what is not seen. It is true. If the window is broken, uh, the baker will have to hire the glazer to replace it. But then time and resource and manpower is devoted merely to replace what had already existed. But what is unseen, Bastiat asks us to, re to, to imagine. Suppose that the street urgent had not come along and broken the window. What would the, the baker have done with the resources, the, 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 the labor time, uh, the effort, uh, the, the amount of money he has to lay out if the window had not been broken. He might very well have bought a new coat for his wife or shoes for his child or invested in, make, in, in purchasing uh, another oven. So that if, imagine that he has one oven that made 100 loaves of, de loaves of bread a day, he would now be able to buy a second oven with the money that he now will otherwise have to lay out merely to replace the window that has been broken with a second oven. And his output now could have been 200 loaves of bread, improving the, the supply of food for the people of the community. Uh, and therefore, it's, re it's important to see what is not seen. Uh, and that is all the uses of the resources, the labor, uh, the, 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 the time, the effort that could have added to the wealth rather than through destruction having to divert resources just to replace what you already had and therefore implicitly leave you poorer. So this type of destruction uh, makes us worse off. And if I can mention how this, these errors continue today, uh, maybe the viewers and listeners know the name Paul Krugman. He is a Nobel Prize winner in economics. Uh, he writes a, I guess, weekly or bi-weekly uh, op-ed piece for the New York Times and has for many, many, many years. And shortly after 9-11 and the trade towers that come smashing down and all the damage and destruction to the neighboring buildings and so on, in one of his pieces, he said, yes, those terrorist acts, they're terrible. The loss of life, the destruction of property. But think of the work and employment for the construction companies, for, for additional hands to be hired. Now, so you have a Nobel Prize winner falling into the same logical and factual trap that Bastiat was, was explaining the, 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 the stupidity of well over 150 years ago. Uh, and and, and the, the, you see this with Biden's build build back better okay well infrastructure is going to create jobs oh you know adding money to the healthcare system is going to create jobs no the government has no resources or money to spend to acquire resources in the marketplace other than what it either taxes or borrows if it taxes it for every dollar spent and quote job created due to the government direction of spending, is a, job, a, a dollar less that a private individual, if he had not been taxed, would have had available to spend in some other direction representing his personal values and preferences and improvements of his own life and own business and the circumstances of his family. Uh, and th that, 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 that if the government borrows the money, 
Uh, the fact is that every dollar borrowed, anyone who has a car loan or a home loan or just a, a student loan, knows that this is resources that others have that could have been used in other ways that have been transferred to you with the promise in the future to pay back the principal and the interest. Well, when the government borrows a sum of money today for build back better, it has no source of it to pay it back than other, other than future taxes and the additional taxes that must be collected to pay the interest on the sum borrowed. So the, the fact is, there are, to use another phrase, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everything has its cost, as long as there's scarcity to use labor, resources, manpower, uh, 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 capital in one direction means that it's not available to be used in another. And if we use it in one way, not reflecting how people would have wanted to spend it, or in the case of the, the, the Baker or the, or the trade tower situation, we are now poorer for having to, in a, word, in a sense, run in place to merely replace what we had rather than growing the wealth to improve our standards of living and its quality uh, looking ahead. It defers progress. Well, you've raised a lot of good points, and let me address some of them. Uh, you mentioned the Manchester School uh, uh, that was taking place in, in England, Cobden and Bright. And one of the things that's always fascinated me is that Cobden and Bright were extremely successful in bringing free trade, free market ideas to Great Britain. And yet their writing is really not very influential today. And yet here you had Frederick Bastiat, who really was a failure when you think in terms of what he accomplished overall in France, especially compared to Cobden and Bright in England. And yet his writings are tremendously influential today, especially among libertarians. Now, of course, he, he was able to get elected to parliament, but in terms of, of influencing people or persuading people, pretty much of a disaster. And yet, I think he, he holds a valuable lesson for us libertarians today, and that is that he never resigned himself to just settling for reform. Uh, he's, he saw that the prevailing attitude was against him, but that didn't cause him to start compromising his principles in his works and in his speeches, that he, he stuck with his principles regardless of the fact that most people in society, you know, with the exception of the people who obviously elected him to parliament, uh, that most people in society were were rejecting what he had to say. I think that's a valuable lesson for those of us that are fighting for liberty today, is that just because the prevailing attitude is against libertarianism, or at least right now, you've got to stick with your principles, uh, not only because sticking with your principles has the potential of influencing people in a positive direction, like with Cobden and Bright, what they were able to accomplish in Great Britain, but also because it's just the right thing to do, and you never know who you're going to influence many years from now, long after you're gone. Uh, your your mention of the of his essay, The Law, is, it struck home with me because when I first discovered that little booklet, it, it just had an enormous impact on me. And that that opening part of the book that says the law perverted was just so powerful, where he talks about that, you know, the the, the if a law takes money from one person and gives it to another person, that's when you know the law is being perverted. So, because today you, you hear people say, well, if it's the law, it's the law. We have to, we have to go along with the law. Well, Bastiat raised it to a higher level for me. That just because it's the law doesn't mean it's right. Uh, that, and this notion that when government takes money from one person, uses the law to take a money from a person to whom it rightly belongs in order to give it to another person, the law is being perverted, that it's immoral, that it's essentially political stealing. Uh, now, you know, look around you today. I mean, people do this all the time with Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, farm subsidies, education grants. And the argument among the leftists and the people that support this thing, and conservatives as well, is that, oh, this shows you that we're moral and we're just for, for doing this through coercion. Bastiat says, oh, no, on the contrary, well, you're just a thief. You, the only difference between you and a regular thief is that you're using the government to do it, the dirty act. But in principle, it, it's still the same. And, and your point about that the only place government has to get its money is through this force called taxation 
is so powerful. I, I remember when I was first discovering libertarianism or before I discovered libertarianism, I couldn't understand why anybody would object to the government helping the poor. Because my feeling was, well, it's the government's money. Why shouldn't it be free to do whatever it wants with its own money? And Bostad opened my eyes to this. Is oh no, the government, the only money government has. It's, it's not like a business where it's producing wealth. The only money it has is is, is the money it's confiscating from people who are producing wealth in the private sector. Well, that, that was a monumental insight for me, and I, I think it's it's one that everybody could benefit from. And your point about what is seen and unseen, too, is another powerful point. The government has all these public projects, like, you know, a, a public housing project or, you know, or a highway or something. And it says, look at this. Look at the jobs we're producing for, for your community. And you see that in, in communities, say, jobs for your community. And they, they, the government is highlighting, look how we're bringing jobs to your community with these projects. Well... Bastia's great insight is let's let's focus on what is unseen. You've taken people's money to pay for this project. What would those people have used their money for? They, as you point out, they would have gone out and bought a coat for their wife, or they would have bought a vacation. They might have saved it, invested it. Uh, but all the jobs that would have come into existence because they would have used their money in a different way than that public project, uh, we don't see those. Uh, because they obviously never come into existence. And that was a fine, phenomenally amazing insight for me, because then it, it opens up a whole new avenue of thinking that if the government's not taxing all these people to do these projects, you have actually a much better situation because people are using the money in the way that they want to use it rather than the government taking it from them and use it in the way the government wants. So at that, let me let me turn it back to you. Yeah, I'll just amplify one or two things that I think are important that you brought out. And, and that is this distinction or difference, uh, or contrast perhaps is the better word, between the British free trade movement and Bastiat in France. Um, the free traders did not triumph immediately. They formed uh, the, uh, the free trade movement uh, in the uh, late 1820s, early 1830s. Um, the agricultural and most of the industrial protectionisms with which domestic British industry and farming were protected uh, did not come down until the middle of the 1840s, around 1846 corn laws, the agricultural protectionism was abolished by an act of parliament just unilaterally. Um, it didn't happen overnight. They worked hard, they published uh, monographs, uh, pamphlets, um, obviously, this is all before radio or television or social media. So they would hold uh, open meetings in lecture halls or out in the air, uh, speaking to the public. Uh, they elected people to parliament, all of whom were not successful for a very, very long time, including uh, Cobden being a member of uh, the British parliament. Uh, but they eventually triumphed and Britain remained free trade. Uh, virtually until uh, the First World War in 1914. Uh, and uh, during their lifetimes and immediately after, uh, Bright and Cobden were admired. Uh, there was a Cobden club in London that in fact kept having annual dinners well after uh, into the 20th century. Um, but who reads Richard Cobden's free trade essays today? Or, or, or John Bright's essays. Um, and in fact, Britain has moved a long way from those free trade ideas. Now, Bastiat had no impact during his life uh, in the political sense, nor could he arouse enough subscribers, that is supporters, financial supporters and donors, to keep his free trade tabloid or newspaper going. But the fact is, is that he died in 1850. Uh, that is now what, uh, over 170 years ago, I guess. And uh, in spite of that, his essays are still in print, uh, translated into multiples of light foreign languages, uh, are re uh, the, 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 the translations that the Foundation for Economic Education sponsored 
by a man named Dean Russell for the most part, they're not only, uh, came out in the 1950s and early 60s. Uh, the Liberty Fund of Indianapolis has just been doing a new uh, you know, collection of, of Bastet's writings with new translations of those pieces, as well as many things never in English before. Um, and he's read. Uh, you find very few classical liberals, libertarians, and in fact, many conservatives who are interested in the ideas, uh, who've not read something about Bastet, the law, or what is seen and what is not seen, or little humorous pieces such as the candlestick maker's petition and so on. So that his ideas continue to influence the climate of opinion uh, of the freedom movement. Whereas nobody reads Copley and Bright anymore. And in that sense, while not affecting policy in his own lifetime, has left an enduring legacy and imprint on the case and the arguments for freedom right to the present time and no doubt well into the future. So forever much he may have seemed as a political failure in his own lifetime, he has been a great uh, uh, permanent fixture and, uh, and, and force far beyond his own lifetime in the realm and the circle and arena of ideas. And, uh, and uh, that, for that, he is one of the, the most important heroes uh, and proponents of liberty uh, that we have had in the last 250 years. Yeah, well, you, you mentioned his books. I know we're about out of time, but let me give you my recommended order, and you, you can tell me whether you would agree with this, that if somebody is just now discovering Frederick Bastiat, I'd recommend start with the law, number one. Number two, I'd go to political sophisms. <laughs> number three, I'd go to uh, political economy. Is that, is essays that like, in political e Essays on political economy. And then I would save economic harmonies to the end. Yes. That would you I agree with you. Um, the, the, the essays in uh, economic sophisms are uh, some of his shorter essays, um, but with that wit and charm, including the candlestick makers petition, if I recall. Uh, the collection called Essays in Political Economy includes uh, the law, includes what is seen and what is not seen, and a wide variety of other pieces. Uh, in the economic harmonies, while a product of the classical economist, he accepts Adam Smith's labor theory of value and so on, is, is a brilliant, brilliant exposition for the, the, the informed and intelligent uh, reader on the case why economics creates an arena of harmony, cooperation, and mutual prosperity. And while all forms of government intervention and control prevent the harmony of society, that freedom makes possible. Yeah, and then finally, I should point out that these books are so easy to read. I mean, it's not the complex economics textbook type of thing we're talking about. We're talking about these were essays for just regular people, the, the masses, so to speak. And that's, I think, what makes them so enjoyable and easy, easy to read and fun to read. Yes. All right. On that note, Richard, we'll wrap things up uh, for this week's Libertarian Angle. Again, if you're new to FFF, come and visit us at FFF.org for 32 years of principled and compromising essays on liberty. Uh, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, subscribe to our FFF daily. Like I say, we, we have strived for more than 20 years now to make that the best libertarian commentary page on the internet, including my daily blog and a monthly article that Richard writes, and along with weekly articles that he submits to other people that we reprint. So, uh, and then subscribe, of course, to our monthly journal. And if you like our work, we'd greatly appreciate your donations, your financial support. That's what keeps us going. Richard, on that note, I enjoyed the conversation as always, and I look forward to seeing you, and I look forward to seeing our viewers next week. Bye-bye.